Hello guys, this has been Azer and you are watching the Surgical White Pot. Today we will talk about the colon and we will start with the surgical anatomy. Here we can see a quick review of the terminology of the parts of the colon, which started as the junction with the terminal ilium, which is the idiosecal valve, then the cecum, ascending colon, hepatic flexure, transverse colon, splenic flexure or the left uh, colonic flexure, descending or the left colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and anus. The colon on average is about 150 centimeter long. The yellow shaded parts, which is the cecum, the transverse colon, and the sigmoid colon, are intraperitoneal parts, which has mesentery and freely mobile. On the other hand, the ascending and the descending colon with the two flexures are uh, considered retroperitoneal parts. The left or the splenic flexure, which is slightly higher than the right or uh, the hepatic flexure, is attached to the diaphragm with the phrenicocolic ligament on which the spleen rests. It is also attached to the spleen with the splenocolic ligament to the lower pool of the spleen. Unlike other retroperitoneal structures, for example, the pancreas or the kidneys, the colon or the retrocolic, uh, retroperitoneal part of the colon is considered from the surgical point of view as an intraperitoneal part uh, because it is easily mobile and easily accessible from the anterior approach. The ascending and the descending colon are usually covered only anteriorly with the peritoneum. But there is other variations. For example, they can be covered partially, a greater part of the circumference covered, uh, and we see here um, paracolic gutta, or uh, they can be totally covered with peritoneum with a short mesentery. Sometimes the ascending and the descending colon are fixed or extra fixed to the uh, retroperitoneal space with the Jackson membrane. It's an extra fixation with subperitoneal connective tissue band on the anterior surface of the colon. The stomach and the colon are connected through the gastrocolic ligament of the greater omentum. Uh, sometimes there is adhesions between the greater omentum and the transverse mesocolon. So one must take care when entering the lesser sac not to injure the transverse mesocolon. So the right approach to the transverse mesocolon, for example, in cases of hemicolectomy, right or the left hemicolectomy, is by elevating the greater omentum or flipping the greater omentum and then approaching the transverse co uh, mesocolon under the transverse colon. Another important landmark regarding the mesocolon is the relation between the sigmoid mesocolon and the left ureter, which passes just beneath its root. Uh, I mean the root of the uh, sigmoid mesocolon. During sigmoidectomy or, uh, or left hemicolectomy, the left ureter must be de demonstrated to avoid its injury, especially in cases of sigmoidal tumors or severe diverticulitis. Uh, the uh, sigmoid mesocolon can be shortened due to the tissue scarring, leading to pulling the uh, left ureter upwards towards the colon, which can be dissected or injured during the uh, dissection of the mesocolon. By careful dissection, the left ureter can be seen as a wide structure uh, which react to light percussion with peristaltic movement. Another site where the ureter can be demonstrated is when it enters the true pelvis crossing over the iliac uh, vessels, which is commonly known as uh, water under the bridge, where the water is the uh, iliac vessel and the bridge is the ureter. Now we will move to the blood supply of the colon. It's uh, supplied mainly by the branches of the superior and the inferior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric artery ends with the um, uh, iliocolic artery, which gives iliac branches, cecal branch, and the appendicular artery. Before this, along its course, the superior mesenteric artery gives the right colic artery to the right colon or the ascending colon and the middle colic artery to the transverse colon. Branches of the superior mesenteric artery supplies the colon until uh, approximately the uh, distal third of the transverse colon. Then on the left side, the inferior mesenteric artery takes over. Its branches are the uh, left colic artery, the sigmoid arteries or branches and the superior rectal arteries. So once more, the superior mesenteric artery gives ileal branches, middle colic artery to the transverse colon, uh, right colic artery to the ascending colon, 
iliocolic artery, which gives ileal branches to the ileal terminal ileum, cecal branch to the cecum, a ventricular artery, which is an end artery. And this, this, this explains uh, thrombosis and gangrene due to inflammation in cases of appendicitis. Inferior mesentric artery gives the left colic artery and a common end of the sigmoidal branches, one to nine branches, and the superior rectal artery. There's a communication between the superior mesentric and the inferior mesentric artery, with the, which is a marginal artery of Dormont. This is a long artery which runs at the uh, mesentrical border of the colon, starting from the ascending colon uh, through the transverse colon and ends at the sigmoidal branch. This continuous artery gives off the vasa recta, which is uh, the uh, artery that supplies directly the colon. Here we would like to add some important hints about the blood supply of the colon. There is an accessory left colic artery that starts from the uh, inferior mesentery towards the splenic flexure, which is present in about 40% uh, of patients. Number two, the left colic artery had two prominent end branches, with the, which is the ascending and the descending branches. Number three, the marginal artery of Dormund is the communication between the superior mesentric and the inferior mesentric artery. And here we can uh, notice what is called the watershed areas, which is areas between uh, the blood supply of two arteries in opposite direction. For example, in the area of the plenic flexure, the blood in the uh, marginal artery of Dormund uh, comes from the superior mesenteric artery, from the middle colic artery, from right to left, and the blood from the distal part comes from the left colic artery downwards to upwards, the opposite direction. Uh, this makes the blood supply of this area a little bit vulnerable to hyperperfusion. It's ever prone to ischemic colitis and it's uh, also uh, always a bad site for anastomosis uh, due to the risk of anastomosic leakage by hyperperfusion and necrosis. Other areas of the colon which uh, show the watershed phenomenon are, um, in addition to the splenic flexure, the sigmoid colon between the sigmoidal branch and the superior rectal branches, and the ascending colon between the right colic branch and the cecal branches. The arc of Ryolan. This, uh, this is a controversial artery uh, or communication between the middle colic artery and the left colic artery. A lot of surgeons argue that this, uh, this artery doesn't exist or exists more in uh, extremely rare cases as a direct connection between the middle colic and the left colic artery and it's only a misnomer of the connection between them which is a marginal artery of, uh, of Dortmund. The concept of high tie versus low tie. This concept is related to the radical oncological resection in cases of sigmoidal or uh, descending colon tumors. A high tie of the inferior mesentric artery means like the ligation of the inferior mesentric directly at its origin from the abdominal aorta, while the low tie means the ligation of the common trunk of the sigmoidal and the superior rectal arteries, sparing the left colic artery. High tie has the advantage of harvesting more lymph nodes for the radical resection and better mobilization of the left hemicolon to create a tension-free uh, colorectal anastomosis. On the other hand, the low tie of the inferior mesentric arteries preserves a good blood supply of the left colic artery, which also leads to um, better results with the uh, anastomosis, with better blood supply of the anastomosis. Whether to do a high tie or low tie is still a highly controversial topic. Now we would like to take a cross section in the colon. Here we can see the colon with the tinea coli, the terminal branch of a colonic artery, uh, like the left colic artery, for example, the marginal artery of Dormund, and the vasa recta in the mesentery of the colon. Here we can see the layers of the colon, mucosa, submucosa, circular muscular layer, and the longitudinal muscular layers, which is the tinea coli, serosa and the appendicitis epiploca, which is fat appendages uh, attached to the colon. The tinea uh, are the tinea colica mesenterica at the mesenteric side of the colon, the tinea colica omentalis at the attachment of the greater omentum, and the tinea colica libra, which is seen freely on the visible surface of the colon. Here in the mesentery, just below the colon, uh, is the marginal artery of Dormund and gives off the vasa recta to supply the colon. 
the vasa rectum had two branches uh, on the circumference of the colon with branches to the appendicitis uh, epiploca and uh, then these branches pierces uh, the um, uh, muscular layer to reach the mucosa. The musculosa which is pierced by these branches is uh, a little bit weakened and this can lead to uh, the bulging of the mucosa outwards in cases of increased uh, intercolonic pressure by uh, persistent constipation, for example. This herniation of the mucosa and the submucosa through uh, a weak part of the musculosa uh, is commonly known as the diverticular disease, which we will talk about in detail in the next episode. So, thanks a lot for listening and see you soon in the next episode.